Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the new town hall, or if you wish, to the defenestration hall, which became for this afternoon the residence of the Institute of Philosophy of the Czech Academy of Sciences. I suppose that everything we need for our joint project is here. Bach's music is still in the air, somewhere under the ceiling. Hopefully some bacterias are here with us as well. I can see in front of me an impatient and strong-minded crowd, like in the defenestration day. And most importantly, in the middle of all this is one of the most inspiring and most influential thinkers of today, Professor Daniel Dennett. This is one of those rare situations in which the name itself is enough. So I can only say how pleased and honored we are to have Professor Dennett and Mrs. Dennett here in Prague as guests, and how grateful we are that Professor Dennett kindly accepted our invitation to give a talk in this gloomy and dangerous place. <laughs> so now let me just ask Professor Dennett and this is going to be the last sentence of this introduction, to be our guide on a tour from Bacteria to Bach and back. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and this is my second visit to Prague. The last time, this is a little too loud, I think. You want a little echoey. There, let's see, I think that's a lot better, yes. Um, I was here in 1981 and uh, gave one of the clandestine seminars to Professor Haydonik's group uh, and it was a very exciting and romantic time, but the city was fairly dreary and no tourists except me and I stuck out like a sore thumb which I didn't like because I was carrying secret messages for people and worried about being followed and all the rest. But it was a great adventure for me and I'm very happy to be back and to see the Czech Republic in such splendid shape uh, uh, after, since my last visit. So, let's see if this is working, yes. Uh, this is the Eng American edition of the book from bacteria to Bach and back. And there's a bacterium, and there's Bach. <laughs> Today I'm going to concentrate mainly on back after a swift review. So here's Darwin, my number one hero. And I want to review what an early critic of his said, and that's uh, about Darwin's strange inversion of reasoning. And uh, the passage will be up on the screen, but I like to read it because the author wrote it with such passion. And uh, I will try to intone the passage the way he had it in mind. In the theory with which we have to deal, absolute ignorance is the artificer. I like the AI there. So that we may enunciate as a system, system, that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. This proposition will be found on careful examination to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning, who, by a strange inversion of reasoning, seems to think absolute ignorance, fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. Exactly right. That is 
Darwin's strange inversion of reasoning, and it's still too strange for many people, even people who are not the least bit religious, but who just can't get their head around this idea. But this is where we have to start. The question I want to introduce to you, I can't answer it in detail, although I try to answer it in more detail in the book, is this. How can a process with no intelligent designer create intelligent designers who can then design things that permit us to understand how a process with no intelligent designer can create intelligent designers who can then design things? Now, is that just a rhetorical question? Some people would like to think so. They would like to think that it implies a contradiction, that there is some embarrassing uh, tension in that statement. Uh, is it a contradiction in the theory of natural selection? No, it's not. But it is tricky to answer. And one of my uh, uh, bits of advice for my students is, when you see a rhetorical question, try to answer it instead of uh, bowing down in front of it and deciding that it is uh, a, a, an implied refutation of your position. So it's tricky to answer. In order to answer it, we have to go back in history a little bit. In fact, we have to go back to prehistory. In fact, we have to go back to the beginning of life on Earth. This is my favorite diagram of the Great Tree of Life. It's uh, Alain Eisenberg's. And on the website, you can, you can get copies of this. You can get big posters and t-shirts and all the rest. And uh, this is time goes from here out here. This is the present. So everything that's alive today, bacteria, fungi, worms, spiders, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, it's all there. Everything that's alive today is on the outer rim there. Uh, here's the origin of life. This great turning point here is something I'm going to talk a bit about. This is the great eukaryotic revolution. Everything here is a eukaryote. The archaea and the bacteria are over here. There's the bacteria from the title, and I am going to say something about bacteria. Um, I want to describe to you, some of you probably know this much better than I, but I want you all to appreciate the uh, great uh, prokaryotic in invasion which led to the existence of eukaryotic cells. Let me just go back. Um, you see there are archaea and bacteria first. And then, here, you now get eukaryotes. Where exactly? Well, nobody knows exactly when. But here's how it happened. There were all these single-celled, simple-celled organisms, prokaryotes. And they were bumping around for a million, a billion years, bumping into each other, and when they bumped into each other, sometimes they just bumped into each other and went on. Sometimes A and B bumped into each other and A ate B. Sometimes they bumped into each other and B destroyed A from the inside. And it only had to happen once. One time, two prokaryotes bumped into each other and joined forces. And that was the birth of the eukaryotic cell. And it turned out that A and B together were fitter than either A or B by themselves. And they had progeny that maintained both A and B. They joined, had a common fate. And that, in very simplified terms, is the birth of the eukaryotes. And the importance of it can hardly be uh, overstated. After all, as you see in the picture, to a first approximation, every living thing that is visible by the naked eye is a eukaryote. You are, and whales are, and trees, and fish, and corn, and clams, and lobsters, and all the rest. They're all eukaryotes. 
And none of them could exist if it weren't for this great joining together of two independently evolved microorganisms, two prokaryotes. As you can see, a prokaryote on the left is a simple sort of thing, a bacterium. A eukaryotic cell, of which you have about a trillion in your body, not counting your uh, visitors, your endosymbiotic visitors, which actually outnumber your human cells by 10 to 1. Eukaryotic cells are more complicated. They have many more moving parts, and hence they're more versatile. So they can be blood cells and hair cells and bone cells and, and uh, brain cells, all kinds of cells, because they can specialize, because they have more moving parts. Um, thanks to Lynn Margulis, who was the uh, uh, scientist, friend of mine, recently died. I'm very proud to say that Tufts University, my university, gave her an honorary degree shortly before her death. Uh, she was the one not, who didn't invent the idea, didn't discover the idea of the endosymbiotic origin of the eukaryotic cell, but in the face of much criticism, she championed the idea, and it's in all the textbooks now, and she's the one who really deserves credit for putting it forward. So we have the prokaryotes joining forces, a few of them, to form eukaryotic cells. And this was a great case of technology transfer. Technology transfer doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. And when it does, you get two independent streams of, of, of research and development which join forces and create a new entity which has many more capabilities than the entities of which it is composed. That's the important idea that I want to take out of this little primer on early history of life on this planet. And remember, there was a, a billion years, you can uh, see it uh, right here, there was a, almost two billion years of independent evolution, research and development. All of these unrelated life forms were developing their own competences to a very high degree. Now I want to close in a little bit more closely and look at where we are. If we look here at the mammals, and we look at that little Y right there, that's about six million years right there. So that branch represents roughly the time it's taken for the chimpanzees, the bonobos, and us to branch apart from a common ancestor. So Homo sapiens is actually doesn't appear until there. I mean, it's just a tiny fraction of the time that life has existed on Earth. So now, if we think of evolution as research and development, we consider it it's a design process. It exploits information in the environment to create, maintain, and improve the design of things. It does this mindlessly. R&D takes time and energy. It's not a miracle. And there's two main varieties. We only know two varieties, really. There's evolution by natural selection. And there's intelligent design, human intelligent design, small i, small d. We are intelligent designers. We are all intelligent designers, some more intelligent than others, and some get rich on their designs, but that's what we are. We're intelligent designers. Now, the processes differ in fundamental ways. Evolution by natural selection is famously purposeless, foresightless, extremely costly, and slow. This is Darwin's strange inversion of absolutely ignorant process over billions of years creates breathtakingly good designs. Intelligent design, in contrast, is purposeful, somewhat foresighted, governed by cost considerations, and usually relatively fast. 
human artifacts, if we stretch the definition, have been around for over a million years, but in the last 10,000 years, they have accelerated tremendously. This is, these design processes are orders of magnitude faster than evolution by natural selection. So evolution may be slow and costly, but it is brilliant. I like to quote the late, great Francis Crick, who once joked about what he called Orgel's second rule after his colleague Leslie Orgel. Evolution is cleverer than you are. Now, remember, this is Crick speaking. This is not capital I, capital D, intelligent design. He's not saying that evolution has a mind, has a purpose. He's saying that in spite of the fact that it's purposeless, mechanical, mindless, without foresight, it nevertheless is a process which can come up with designs that are so ingenious, so efficient, so brilliant, that human designers have a hard time matching, let alone improving on them. Time and again, biologists think they've identified bad, stupid flaw in the design of some organism, only to discover a little later when they understand it better that it's a brilliant design, it's better than anything they would have designed. Well, as I've already pointed out, intelligent design now exists. We are surrounded by its fruits and are uh, empowered by its fruits every day. And it's becoming ever more intelligent. So now the question is, is it the summit of evolution? Is this the end of evolution? No. It is a major transition. I use the term uh, in the sense of Zathmary and Maynard Smith, uh, two fine evolutionary theorists, wrote a book some years ago called The Major Transitions of Evolution. And at each one of these major transitions, you get some dramatic shifts which permit evolution or design, R&D, to happen much more efficiently, much faster. You'll be pleased to know that sex is one of the uh, major transitions of evolution. Okay, so this is all very optimistic. Things are getting better and better, faster and faster. It's wonderful, but we haven't come close to explaining this transition at all. And now I want to present my puzzle in a different guise. On the left, you see an Australian termite castle. On the right, you see Antoni Gaudí's famous La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, which today is in Spain. <laughs> we'll see where it is next week. Uh, you will be struck by the astonishing similarity between these two structures. Even internally, the structures are very similar. They are both remarkable R&D achievements. They are both designed and produced. Here are two artifacts produced by living things, by living eukaryotes, you could say. The one on the left is created by termites, and they are not meaning to disparage them, clueless. There is no boss termite. There's a queen termite, but she's not the boss. She's more like the crown jewels than the boss. She carries the eggs. There's no architect. There's no blueprint. There's no design rationale, no manifesto. This is clueless, bottom-up, Darwinian natural selection has achieved this state of affairs where the termites themselves are engaging in a sort of trial and error process that builds these amazing structures without any 
intelligent design at all. Oop, pushed the wrong button. There. Gaudi, on the other hand, is a perfect example of the charismatic genius, uh, megalomaniac, egotistical. He's got blueprints, he's got manifestos, he's got it all worked out in his head in advance, and he's lording it over his subordinates who lord it over their subordinates who lord it over their subordinates until you get down to the people that are cutting the stone and laying the bricks. And uh, so very much top-down organization of the whole project compared with the termite castle, which is bottom-up. No leaders, no intelligent design. Now, here we see a fine uh, micrograph uh, image. This is a neuron, two neurons uh, joining forces in a Petri dish. Uh, so those are individual neurons. They're quite active. They send out these little processes, and hunt around to make better connections. And now I want to zoom in even farther and let's see if this will run. Oh, bother. It looks like it's not going to run. Oh, well, maybe it will. Ah, yes, I think it will. I'm just going to show you a little bit of this. Please run. Yes, it's going to run. Some of you may have seen this. It's available on the web, I think, now. This is a very carefully done rendition of what's going on inside every cell in your body. These are the, these are the moving parts inside your cells. They form long microtubular highways that form and then dissolve, form and dissolve, like that. This is happening right now in a trillion cells in your body. And along comes something that cuts them. It cuts them in just the right place, but it doesn't know why it's doing that. It's like a termite. Dissolving, those are those, oh, and here comes a motor protein. Walking along, carrying its load. You have lots of these mindless little robotic porters moving in your cells right now. I'm, I'm sure you know the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. These, these uh, motor proteins are like the, like the, the brooms, the, the many brooms that carry the water. So that's enough of that. I think we'll move along now. So here's a puzzle. I've already told you about bottom-up design versus top-down design. Now, a termite colony might be as many as 70 million clueless termites. In your brain, you have, by latest count, about 86 billion even more clueless neurons. And if we look inside them, we see trillions of even more clueless motor proteins and things like that. Now here's the question. How do you get a Gaudi type mind out of a termite colony brain? If the organ you have between your ears is in an important regard like a termite colony, each neuron is an independent little agent of sorts, not as mobile, mobile as a termite, but still fending for itself. And, and myopic. How do you organize 86 billion of those to make a human mind, to make a Gaudi? Well, here's the short answer. You can't do much carpentry with your bare brain, bare hands, and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. This was uh, said by my friend and colleague Bo Dalbum from uh, Stockholm. 
And it is the key to understanding the mind of Gaudi. And your mind, too. A termite colony is a bare brain, no thinking tools. Intelligent designers have well-equipped brains with lots of tools. Where, when did they get their tools? Well, we can look back at the great tree of life, and the answer is within the last million years. So most of the time when there's been life on this planet, there haven't been any thinking tools. So it's a very recent development on the planet. And how did they get their tools? Well, now here's the wrong answer from my friend Freeman Dyson. Technology is a gift of God. After the gift of life, it is perhaps the greatest of God's gifts. It is the mother of civilizations, of arts, and of sciences. I hope I won't be defenestrated if I say <laughs> technology is not a gift of the gods or of God. However, the rest of the sentence is, is I think, quite acceptable. It's perhaps the greatest gift of evolution. Yes, it is the mother of civilizations, of arts, and of sciences. Now we have to spell that answer out a little bit. If it isn't a gift from God, it must be cultural evolution that is responsible. And cultural evolution is itself a process of natural selection, as clueless, as mindless, as foresightless, as genetic natural selection that nevertheless was able to design thinking tools that impose novel structures on our brains. In other words, these novel structures are what you might call evolved virtual machines. There's the brain you're born with, and that's the hardware, if you want, or the wetware. And then there's the habits, the micro habits, that are imposed on that brain by the imposition of culture, of language in particular, but also making pots and building houses and planting corn and all the other things that we've learned to do, which we don't pass on through the genes. In other words, these thinking tools are apps that we download to our necktops. And just as a laptop or a cell phone without any apps on it is not a very competent thing. Great potential, but what can it do? You pile on the apps and all of the added competence comes from the virtual machines. An app is basically a virtual machine that you install on your, uh, on your phone or your laptop. And the claim I'm making, and it's not it's, it's a little bit metaphorical, but it's mainly literal, is that what cultural evolution does is it designs and installs on your brain apps, virtual machines, which then give your brains powers that they otherwise wouldn't have. Those are the thinking tools without which you can't do much thinking. And they are the source of our power and versatility. Now, in order to understand that, we have to look to one of my other heroes, Turing, and his strange inversion of reasoning. You remember that Darwin's strange inversion in capital letters from Beverly is, in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. Turing had a similar, in fact, a parallel insight. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computing machine, it is not requisite to know what arithmetic is. In his day, a computer was a person, typically a woman, trained in mathematics, 
knew exactly what arithmetic was and usually quite intelligent and, and trained. This was, this was a high-tech job. And he realized you could cut that all out and have a purely mechanical competence which could do all the arithmetic, all the uh, calculation, all the computing you needed. Where, uh, while the small parts that were doing the work were clueless. As clueless as motor proteins, as clueless as neurons. So together, Darwin and Turing put forward the idea of competence without comprehension. This is, if you like, my bumper sticker. It's the, it's the main theme of my book. It is the idea that we have it backwards. We send our children to university. Why? Because we believe that we want them to be very competent in the world, and we think that competence flows from comprehension. First, you understand, and then use your understanding to, to enhance your competence. And here are both Darwin and Turing in their different ways saying, no, that's upside down. Understanding is composed of competence. First, you're competent. And thanks to that competence, you come to understand. It sounds philistine, behavioristic, drill and practice in school. It sounds subversive to many people. But it is the key. And the outrage that Beverly felt when he read Darwin is the same outrage, I submit, that a lot of people confront when they consider Turing and computers and artificial intelligence, the very idea that you could make a comprehending intelligent agent out of computers seems shocking, outrageous to many people. It's the same outrage as Beverly's outrage about Darwin. So on this view, mind, that is consciousness, understanding, it's not the cause, it's the effect. Now, termites are not intelligent designers. Beavers are also not very intelligent designers. We are the first intelligent designers in the tree of life, but we're not that intelligent. We are just as likely to engage in competence without comprehension, without recognizing it, without acknowledging it. And yet that competence has achieved amazing results that are visible even to the wide-angle biological lens. The late, great Paul McCready wrote about what I call the McCready explosion. He points out that 10,000 years ago, the human population, plus their livestock, their pets, their dogs, their, their chickens, their pigs, was less than 1%, a fraction of 1% of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. That's leaving out all the insects, it's leaving out all the worms, it's leaving out the fish in the sea, so, animals, terrestrial vertebrates. Less than 1%. That was 10,000 years ago. Today, it's 98%. We and our domesticated animals have engulfed the planet to where we now outnumber all the other terrestrial vertebrate species 50 to 1. Most of that's cattle, and that's in 10,000 years. That's a biological change. That's one of the fastest and greatest changes to the biosphere since life began. Ranks right up there with the eukaryotic revolution. And here's what McCready says about it. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence 
to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. Now this was another great technology transfer. The invasion of human brains by symbiotic thinking tools. Not so many years ago, 40 years ago, Richard Dawkins came up with a name for such invading, evolved tools, memes, in his book, The Selfish Gene. So these thinking tools, we don't inherit them via our genes. I think that's obvious to everybody. But we also don't have to design them ourselves. Think of the thinking tools you have, you carry around with you effortlessly right now. Your languages, your capacity to do arithmetic, to do uh, probability theory, to do long division, to alphabetize a list of words, to uh, read a map, to tell time, to uh, the list goes on indefinitely. We're the only species that has any of that. We don't have to design them ourselves. And it's not because somebody already designed them for us. Nobody has to design them. Nobody had to design the wing of the eagle, and nobody has to design language. Language evolves by natural selection, but not primarily natural selection of genes. There's a co-evolutionary process between the natural selection of cultural items, memes, and the natural selection of genes that enhance the capacities of the wetware to deal with the new software. And that's something we see in technology as well. We see changes in hardware following changes, advances in software. We see the underlying hardware enhanced, adjusted, refined, redirected because new software becomes so valuable, so usable, so, so popular that it pays for the hardware to evolve to make that software more, more effective. So these thinking tools are designed by the differential replication of memes. So what are memes made of? They're made of information, which I've cut, I myself am now used to talking this way. Information isn't stuff, doesn't weigh anything, it doesn't have mass, but as Norbert Wiener, by the way, the most illustrious alumnus of my university of Tufts, Norbert Wiener once said, information is information, not matter or energy, and no contemporary materialism can do without the concept of information. I think he was right. I don't want to just cite authority. I want to suggest that now, in the information age, we should start taking information seriously as a fundamental category. We have mathematical and non-mathematical models and tools to think about information and see how powerful it is. I'm just going to give you one little example. I have a colleague, a very fine philosopher of biology, I will not name him because I don't want to embarrass him, who once bit the bullet on this, as we say, and argued with me. He said, but Dan, software doesn't really exist. It doesn't exist. I said, what? Wait, are you telling me that Bill Gates should be put in jail for fraud? What's he been selling all these years that makes him the richest man in the world? Software, what's it made of? Information. Informational structures are as real as real can be. They're just not made of carbon and hydrogen and so forth. They depend on material vehicles but information itself, and in fact, you've known this forever. Poems are not made of ink, 
right let's look at the things that are made of information most general term i know is ways of doing things or habits including micro habits little habits in your brain words Numbers, poems, symphonies, theories, algorithms, proofs. These are just a few of the things in our daily lives that are fundamentally informational things. They all depend on one physical vehicle or another, but they survive intact through translation. You can have the very same song on a CD, on a vinyl record, or just playing aloud in the corner with a group of musicians. The same information, different realizations. So then, what the McCready explosion is, is an explosive amplification of competence, and it was initially competence without comprehension. Our ancestors didn't have to know what they were doing when they first began to be the beneficiaries of these thinking tools that were invading their brains. They were no more, they no more had to understand them than, uh, moths that have eye spots on their wings which protect them from predator birds because when they open their wings it looks like a pair of menacing eyes. The moths don't have to understand that to be the beneficiary. And our ancestors didn't have to understand the rationale of their designs in order to benefit from them. So what happened was Human culture began as competence without comprehension, and it gradually evolved into competence with comprehension. And so what we get is the Darwinian strange inversion reinverted. We're going to move from competence without comprehension to comprehension as a product of competence. Now, for years I've been using a term which many people don't like. I'm stuck with it now, and so I'll try to make the best of it, and that's free-floating rationales. These are reasons that things do things for that are not represented by those things themselves. Trees do things for reasons, but they don't have minds. They don't have to have minds, but nevertheless, some of the things they do, they do for reasons. Fungi do things for reasons. The biotic world is saturated with reasons from the molecular scale on up. That little restriction enzyme that broke off the, the uh, macromolecule, there was a reason why I did it, but it doesn't have to know. It's competence without comprehension. But there is a reason. This just doesn't have to be represented or appreciated by the beneficiary. We do things for reasons. We shiver, we vomit, we blink. We don't know why. Well, uh, today we do. But there's still things that we do. We don't know why. Yawning, for example. Nobody's quite sure why we yawn. Something we do, there's probably a reason. It's a free-floating rationale because nobody, well, you can yawn on purpose and do that for a reason, but that's a special case. Reasons we don't need to appreciate. So here's the problem that culture solves. How do we get a Bach mind out of a termite colony brain? How do we get intelligent design with a representation of reasons out of 86 billion mindless neurons? The second great endosymbiotic revolution, human culture. In other words, we're apes with infected brains. Now, I want to briefly introduce a diagram. I make much of these diagrams in the book but I'm, not, I'm going to spare you the details, just introduce the idea of this diagram. This is a Peter Godfrey Smith uh, Darwinian space. And it's a regular three-dimensional graph space, 
x, y, z coordinates. And you can take any three features of populations that you like and model them on the three dimensions. In this one, you'll see that on the x dimension, we have bottom up versus top down. I've already told you about that dimension. On the vertical dimension, we have comprehension from none to high. And then on the uh, uh, z dimension, we have random versus directed search. When evolution gets started, it's trial and error, it's random search, mindless, purposeless process. It doesn't know why it's doing what it's doing, but random search can get you somewhere as long as you have some way of identifying the things that are better from the things that are worse. So if we start in the lower left-hand corner, we start with very Darwinian R&D. Termite castle culture, if you like, and they don't have much culture that we, they may have a little, but the capacity of termites to do what they do, probably almost all in the genes and the gene environment interactions. And it's very low in comprehension. It's bottom up. And insofar as there is search involved, it's pretty random. Up in the upper far right corner, we have intelligent design, which is high in comprehension. It's top down. We put Gaudi up there. And it's directed search. It's, this is purposeful search, efficient search. This is intelligent search. And I'm going to put Picasso up in that corner. Not because he's the most intelligent designer of all times, but because, in effect, he said he was. He said, je ne cherche pas, je trouve. I don't search. I find. I find. In other words, I don't have to do that grubby trial and error. I don't have to erase and extinguish. I just go right to the summit the highest point in design space every time with my genius perception. This is the perfect boast of the intelligent designer. And of course, it wasn't true of Picasso. Not close. It wasn't true of Mucha, who the wonderful museum I visited, we visited uh, yesterday. Brilliant line, but even he did a little searching along the way to make his, his items. So Picasso, even he could not meet his own boast. He was very clever, though. Unlike a lot of other intelligent designers, instead of throwing away the rejects, he signed them and sold them. A very intelligent move for a designer to make, if you can do it. But I'm going to replace. Picasso with Bach, who was an exemplary intelligent designer. He had a very deep comprehension of what he was doing. Why? Because he had a mind full of mind tools. He, was highly he had highly constrained trial and error methods. He wrote a new cantata every week for some years. All of them, just about all of them, really brilliant. So he's working at a tremendous pace constrained by knowledge, by comprehension, by foresight. He was magnificently equipped with thinking tools, with music theory, and with a vast knowledge of the history of music. He was also, you may not know this, not just a player of organs, but a repairer and reviser and designer of organs. He was, he was a high-tech uh, musical designer of his time. Now let's compare two human artifacts. On the left, we have an Ashelaian hand axe. On the right, of course, a mouse. Thanks to Matt Ridley for this wonderful slide. Our ancestors made Ashelaian hand axes without any change, no noticeable change in structure for approximately a million years. 
They're quite mysterious objects, actually. The mouse, well, nobody invented the Ashleyan hand axe. Douglas Eng Engelbart invented the mouse, and it's going to go extinct maybe in a few years. Tremendous difference in temporal scale in the tempo of design and research. And in the middle, we have all of these cases of semi-comprehending competence. One of my favorite examples comes from the philosopher Alain, writing in 1908 about the fishing boats of Brittany. And he says, every boat is copied from another boat. Let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It is clear that a very badly made boat will end up at the bottom after one or two voyages and thus never be copied. One could then say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those which function and destroying the others. If it comes back, copy it. That's evolution by natural selection. And you don't have to understand why it comes back you don't have to understand what's good about the design. You just copied the design that works. And in fact, you may have all sorts of ideas about how to improve the design. Go ahead, try them out, mutate the design. You may find out that your brilliant ideas are not as good as Mother Nature's ideas. Many a brilliant boat designer has designed a worse boat when thinking they were designing a better boat. The point of this example is that over a long period of time, boat design stabilizes, improves. The, the world's watercraft are wonderfully designed for what they do. And much less of that has to be understood by the boat builders, the boat users, the boat designers than is commonly supposed. If it comes back, copy it. Why do you build your boats this way? Because that's what grandpa did. It's good enough for grandpa, it's good enough for me. And so it goes. Mag uh, multiply that example across human culture and you see that a great deal of culture has been wonderfully designed without benefit of much human comprehension. By the way, there's a wonderful recent book, more or less contemporaneous with mine, by, by Joseph Henrich called The Secret of Our Success. And I highly recommend it. He goes through in wonderful detail, empirical detail, lots of examples of excellent human design in cooking, in boats, in kayaks, in, in weaponry, in building methods, where it's pretty clear that the people who are actually doing the construction don't have to and don't, in fact, understand why they're doing it the way they're doing it. But now we live in the age of intelligent design. Cultural evolution has become ever more top-down, ever more comprehending and self-comprehending, ever more refined in its search methods. And so has genetic evolution. Today we have gen uh, GM food, genetically modified food, and we have the efforts of people like Craig Venter. So now we want to know what next. Are we entering the age of post-intelligent design? And in many fields, the answer is yes. Intelligent designers are exploiting the truth of Orville's second rule. Evolution is cleverer than you are. If they can get an artifact, a thinking tool, to do the heavy lifting for them, they don't have to understand it themselves. So we have genetic algorithms. The whole rebirth of artificial intelligence is a rebirth of Darwinian or Darwinesque methods of design and exploration, which has this strange and wonderful and scary feature of being competence without comprehension. Genetic algorithms, as uh, 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 John Holland's brilliant invention, have the uh, they wear their Darwinesque flavor on their sleeves. These are. This is virtual evolution in virtual worlds, evolution of better and better algorithms. Deep learning is the name that seems to be sticking. 
for the varieties of reinforcement learning growing out of the work by Jeffrey Hinton and others, which is now taking off on all sides. It's the hottest technology going. We have Bayesian networks. We have other varieties of machine learning. And you know some of the products of this, like IBM's Watson, like Google Translate. And there are many, many others. All of these are exploiting aspects of the Darwinian process of natural selection. They are hugely redundant, hugely expensive, no worry about, they're so cheap to run that the fact that you run through millions of cases, no big deal, we'll run through millions of cases. These are ways of finding needles in haystack without knowing why you're doing or what you're doing or why, but you can sure find those needles. And this has led many to worry about what some of us have been calling black box science. You buy a shiny new black box with a lot of computation inside. You put your question in. The black box goes and feeds on unbelievable amounts of data that are now available to feed to black boxes. And after half an hour or a few minutes or a few seconds, out comes your answer. I mean, you've, you've used Google Translate maybe or, or, or just Google Search. These are all using methods of this sort. And so now it looks like even for the very cutting edge of science, we're beginning to develop techniques where you don't have to understand why the answers are good, but you know that they are good because you, you can more or less prove that it will be very reliable even though you yourself cannot articulate, nobody can, how the thing works, just why this is the right answer. It's very hard to see the limits of such systems. Now this has among its many implications a new light on an issue that's been bothering me for decades. Noam Chomsky for years has been speaking about the difference between problems versus mysteries. He has notoriously claimed that as we look out at human inquiry, we see there are problems and there are mysteries. Problems we can solve. We've solved many of them. The problem of inheritance. We have DNA, we understand it. The problem of earthquakes. The problem of plate tectonics. The problem of the redshift. The problem of the Big Bang. We're, those are all problems and we're making great progress on them. Then he said there are mysteries. Mysteries are beyond human ken now and forever. I have always despised this view. I don't just dislike it. I, I think it is a pernicious view because here is one of the great, brilliant scientific minds of the age telling people, don't even try to solve the problems that he finds beyond solution. Of course, I may be taking this personally. After all, his two favorite examples of mysteries are consciousness and free will, about which I've had a lot to say, and I may not have the final solution to the problems, but the very idea that I am just beating my head against the wall, that there's no hope, I find that uh, uh, a dishonorable position. I, I just, I, I am just that up unhappy about it, and have been for years. Um, as I say, free will and consciousness are mysteries, according to him. I left a C out there. Well, in, in Chomsky's wake, a whole school of speaking loosely thought has grown up called Mysterianism. And among its exponents are Jerry Fodor, Colin McGinn, and Thomas Nagel, who have all in their different ways. These are all philosophers, if you probably know them. They have all, in their various ways, endorsed the idea that there's what 
Fodrin again called cognitive closure. These are, these are things beyond human ken. Now I've argued against that. I won't review, if you want to know the arguments against that, you can find them in some of my earlier work. But I want to point out that Chomsky's now changed his tune a little bit in an interesting way. Uh, here's what he says now. While there is a conceptual distinction between problems and mysteries, he says, we accept the best explanations science can give us, even when we can't imagine how they work. It doesn't matter what we can conceive anymore. We've given up on that. Now, my question is, does comprehension matter? He is, in effect, saying, no, it doesn't. Do we want to do post-comprehension science? I don't think so. Do we want to have technological competence without comprehension? Even less, I think. I think comprehension is important, and I'm going to try to say why to close out my talk. I've already told you about the current wave of AI, which yields results but can't explain why those are the results. So now DARPA, which funds a lot of this research, that's the, that's the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency of the Pentagon, has funded this work for decades. DARPA has a new uh, 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 program in explainable AI, the idea of which is to get the AI to be able to explain how it got its answers. Uh, I think that's in some ways wonderful, in some ways misguided. The main thing I want to claim is we should not try to make persons out of them. On the one hand, we might follow DARPA and say, look, we want to make these AIs as much like human beings as possible so they can explain their reasoning to us in terms that, that we can understand. We want them to converse in our idiolect just fine. And so that they can develop their own imaginative curiosity and epistemic goals. On the other side, I think this will blur the lines of moral responsibility. If you treat the artificial intelligence as a competent moral agent, and you try to pass the buck to that agent when it makes a mistake, how do, what, what penalty can it pay? How do, you, how do you punish an AI for giving you the wrong answer? What I suggest instead is that what we need are some legal innovations. First of all, for the really powerful systems, the ones, because of their power, they're dangerous as well as useful, you should have to be licensed. And in order to be licensed, you'd have to pass some tests. And of course, if you were licensed, you'd want to be bonded, and we would have strict liability laws. In other words, if you're a licensed user of this system, and you recommend a course of action which turns out to be wrong because you trusted the system when you shouldn't have, you are responsible. It's the same rule that we have, at least in the States, for pharmacists. It's a, it's a, it's a profession which is lucrative but risky. And so we put an extra burden of concern on the pharmacist to make sure they don't make mistakes. Because if they do make a mistake, they can't say, well, I didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse if you have a strict liability law. When you know that you're taking on a position where you're going to be held responsible, whether or not you could have done anything about it, you go carefully. And that's what we want. Now, of course, these people will need to have malpractice insurance. Very large malpractice insurance policies. And the insurance companies will not want to insure them unless the makers of the AI have gone out of their way to make the systems as clear and as transparent and as un- uh, um, misleading as possible. 
makers will have the same incentive to advertise the flaws and gaps and weaknesses of their systems that pharmaceutical companies now have when they advertise a new drug on television, at least in the United States. Uh, when you see an ad for a new uh, drug, it is followed by a hilariously long, rapidly spoken list of known side effects. That's by law. They have to do that, otherwise they're in deep trouble. They're breaking the law. So they cover themselves by listing all the known side effects. Similarly, the AI people should have to list all the known or suspected shortcomings or flaws of their system. Now this is just the opposite of the way the field has been going for many years. And oddly enough, I have to blame Turing in a way for that. Because when he originally set out the idea of the Turing test, it was designed as a test in where the machine tries to trick the human judge into thinking that it's human. And so there's been a premium on anthropomorphic presentation, self-presentation for over 50 years. And that's too bad. We wanna, we wanna nip that in the bud. We wanna get rid of the phony personal uh, nature of the AIs so that users of these systems will have a clearer idea of what their shortcomings are. And this is a tall order because, as I've argued for many years, when we encounter anything that's puzzling and complex, we try to treat it as what I call an intentional system. And that means attributing it to it rationality uh, and having rational beliefs and desires. It's, that's the only way you can do it, and it almost always overshoots. We always are too generous in our interpretations of comprehension to things that are intentional systems. We do it with dogs and cats, we do it with dolphins and, and, and birds, and we do it with each other, and we do it with ourselves, and we do it with AIs, and we want to try to break that habit, with, especially with AIs. So what I'm imagining is a sort of reverse Turing test where the system tests the potential user to see if the user can figure out what its shortcomings as a machine are. And if it can't, it fails, it doesn't get a license, and it can't use the system. The computer challenges the user to find the flaws, gaps, and shortcuts. Well, now, how do we do this? There's another side to this, and it's, a, it's an educational side, and it's something I've been working on indirectly for many years. Many years ago at Tufts, I and a colleague started what we call the curricular software studio, where the whole idea, the purpose of this was to use computers to enhance human comprehension. And our metaphorical motto was, look, there's two kinds of empowerment, the bulldozer way and the Nautilus machine way. The bulldozer way, you can move great mountains, but you're still a 98-pound weakling. The Nautilus machine, machine is technology designed to give you the strength. We want to do the same thing for cognition, for comprehension. We want to design software that enables you to understand, to comprehend complex issues. It's possible. We had a nice run for a decade and more, made some products I'm very proud of, uh, but with the way technology gallops ahead, most of those are now uh, have been superseded or set aside. But at any rate, it, it is a way of thinking about the possibilities of AI, which is very different from the way most people are thinking about them. Making AIs that are Nautilus machines for the mind, in other words, tools, not colleagues. Well, intelligent design is the current phase of the evolution of Homo sapiens. If we understand how we got here, we have a better chance of enjoying the future. Thanks for your attention. So many thanks to Professor Dennett for this exciting talk and great performance. 
And now we are back from the trip and can open the discussion. So please, if you have a question which can be articulated in a few and clear English sentences, so please raise your hand and wait until our colleague brings you a microphone. So we will start with the first question. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, but I would come to back to the mysteries and ask whether before Darwin, actually our de design of humans, so, so the body was not a mystery in the Chomsky sense. That means that there had to happen something in science to turn the mystery of evolution into the problem of evolution. And maybe with self-consciousness, we just didn't have the, the Darwin around us. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. I, I think what you said I, I agree with. That is to say, um, if we go back to Plato and Aristotle, it, a lot of things are mysteries. Yeah, Vision is a mystery, and, and the, the heavens are a mystery. And we've gradually demystified. Yeah, but maybe that uh, self-consciousness is a mystery because we don't have the kind of or the approach, like Darwin introduced evolution, so maybe we need something more to turn it into a problem, the self-consciousness. Well, of course, that's music to my ears. I think I've got to something more, and it's very much along the lines of Darwin. Um, it's, and, and I'm not the only one that's working on this. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can get a sketch of it in my book. The, the fundamental idea is that we have to recognize that the human brain cannot be designed top-down the way traditional AI thought of and traditional cognitive science thought of designing uh, uh, a cognitive system. We have to have an architecture, a computational architecture, which is more open-ended and where the parts are uh, themselves agents, minimal agents that can compete and also collaborate and form coalitions that dissolve and reform and so forth. And that if we take seriously the idea of the brain as a large population of semi-independent autonomous, semi-autonomous agents that can be uh, enticed in effect into working for a living, doing various things, and then think about what kind of, of uh, impositions we could make on that architecture and impose from the outside, that's the cultural uh, thinking tools, then we'll have a theory of consciousness worth having for the first time. Thank you again for your talk, but uh, coming back to your tool, you've been working on at your university for enhancing the comprehension capacity. Uh, do you think it could be possible to join forces in enhancing this comprehension uh, by common attacking the consciousness or maybe artificial intelligent agents by teaching them music and arts and mathematics in the same time? And the second part, do you think it would be eventually possible to reach a better understanding of human mind by working this way with artificial agents? Oh, that's a very, that's a very good question. And it's the dream of many people to uh, working in, in effect, the cognitive science of the arts. And so we have in music, we have people doing computational uh, models of music uh, and of musical composition, um, such as David um, Cope and his EMI, and, and uh, certain efforts in artificial agents that, that do art. Poetry, nothing very impressive so far. And I'm, I think that's all valuable as uh, oh, 
I think that's valuable in the same way that behaviorism was valuable. Skinnerian behaviorism. Skinnerian behaviorism was valuable because until they spent 30 years trying to make models using their behavioristic rules that would actually do some serious intelligent stuff, um, you had to take it seriously. After you saw how far they were from, from getting it, uh, from getting the results that they aspired to, now we can, we can set that avenue more or less aside. Uh, not that it's, I don't want to get into the weeds here. Um, reinforcement learning is, is back with a vengeance, but it's very different from the Skinnerian variety. From principles, from yes, yes, yeah. Using yeah. Well, I think I think that's right. I think that um, the the strange inversion that I've been talking about, which says actually comprehension comes from competence. I think it's very important today, now, to stress that because people have for so long underestimated the power of that. And we've had, I think, some really fairly, uh, in, in retrospect, fairly silly campaigns. For instance, in America, I don't know if it hit in Czechoslovakia or in, Czech, in, the, in the Czech uh, Republic. We had uh, the new math, where children were taught set theory before they were taught arithmetic. And this was supposed to be a brilliant way of teaching math because they would understand the deep principles of mathematics before they ever bothered memorizing the multiplication table or learning how to do uh, uh, subtraction and addition. Hopelessly bad idea because, and, and uh, many children were, were baffled and stumped and, and uh, driven away from mathematics by this misguided attempt to teach them principles before they had the basic competences. So w we want to find a middle ground. I, I guess I'm stressing the competence comes first angle because for one thing, I think it's important to demystify the otherwise very popular idea of comprehension as a sort of unified, special, wonderful talent that we have. That goes back to Descartes, and I think it's a complete myth. I don't think there is any such thing as sort of pure comprehension. There's only impure comprehension. Many philosophers really hate that, but I think they hate it for proprietary reasons. It's part of what they think they think it's an enabling assumption of their discipline. After all, they're not gathering facts. <laughs> they're just sitting there comprehending. And so they think the pure comprehension must exist, otherwise philosophy would be impossible. Whereas I would say philosophy is possible only when you supplement it with a good deal of, of the sorts of competence that require empirical knowledge. Yeah. Hello? Here. Uh, I would like to ask you, you said that the biotic world is saturated with reasons and that the evolution is intelligent. It seems to me that uh, you are using the term intelligence very freely. And uh, because there's, the question is, is uh, matter intelligent in some way? Is electrons intelligent if you can talk about bacteria being intelligent? And if not, if you could answer me, like, what is not intelligent, and, or what is without reasons, and why? I'm, I'm not sure I got one of the words you were using there. Was it intelligent? Uh, intelligence. Intelligence, OK. But now, please repeat your question. I want to just think about what you said slightly differently. Uh, Basically, what's, uh, my point is, it seems to me that you have used uh, intelligence for evolution. which And you said evolution is intelligent. It's smart, it's clever. No, no. Evolution is stupid, is stupid as sand. It just has brilliant results. 
Okay, but uh, in some sense you are using it as it's like a kind of, uh, you said, like uh, bottom to top uh, in a way intelligence. But it seems to me that you can uh, say, like look for this kind of intelligence even in uh, something like uh, electrons, water or like solar system. Because there are some rules and if you can say that the trees have reasons, where is the end of these reasons and what, what is without the reasons? Hmm. Okay. That's, that's a question I understand. Um, and I devote pretty much a chapter to it in my book where I talk about two different why questions. In English, the word why, the question why, has two, at least two, but two very distinct meanings. In one it's how come, and the other is what for. What for asks a purpose, a reason in that sense. How come just asks for a narrative that says what brought it about, what's, a, what's the causal history. So let's compare um, two questions. Why are planets spherical? And the answer is a, that's a how come why question, and it's answered in terms of gravity and mass, and that's why they're spherical. And that's why small asteroids that don't have enough mass don't have to be spherical because the gravitational forces are not sufficient to pull the whole thing into the shape of a sphere. But now let me ask, why are ball bearings spherical? There, they're spherical for a purpose. There's a reason why you want ball bearings, or say soccer balls, footballs, to be spherical. You ask why, why is this spherical? Two different answers. One, there's a purpose. One, there's just a causal history. Now, if we think about those two questions, we see that the great contribution, one of the great contributions of Darwin is he showed how you can move from a universe where there are only how come questions to a world where there's what for questions. It all starts off, nothing has a reason, it's just matter in motion, it's just the laws of physics, and gradually, always gradually, we move from that world into a world where things exist for reasons where they have functions, where they have purposes. The sand on the beach doesn't have a function. The ice on top of a pond doesn't have a function. But the swim bladder of the fish under the ice has a function. And uh, the plant rooting in the ground, its parts have functions. So we move in Darwin from how come to what for? And that distinguishes the things that have purposes and eventually when we pursue that, we get to things that are arguably intelligent. And intelligence is simply a, a gradual accretion up that path. So now we have one question here and then there. Yeah, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, I have a question which has to do with uh, the last part of your presentation. And that was about uh, kind of a harnessing some of the system you call them, you know, the AI systems, which have to do with uh, mechanisms or entities or machines we are now dealing with, or maybe just systems of information, which are very powerful. And you also tackled some of the basic assumptions we have about comprehension, we have about free will, and we have about consciousness. So this debate actually seems for me, seems to me, and I just wanted comments on that, whether we should not rethink in order to be still in a bit of a charge of the whole thing. Also the def basic definitions of what the, what the humanity is and what is the, what is the agency 
we're dealing with, you know, if there is a difference between agency as an agency inherent, inherently linked to humans, an agency is something which is active around us and with us, to do with this empowerment, you know, other agencies, and we're not talking about some sort of new biology of, you know, AIs or these kind of things. So I'm just asking about the new borders of humanity and a bit of a rethinking of what the humanity, what it is to be human vis-a-vis -vis things we've heard about today. Thank you. I think that you raise a very interesting problem for which there's not going to be any one answer. And that is where, where the boundaries are most comfortably drawn between human agents and other kinds of agents and things that aren't agents at all. And <clears throat> it's all very well for me to say, let's keep them tools, not colleagues. And we want to keep that gap as wide as possible. We don't want to have lots of things right in the middle where they raise problems. Um, sometimes a gap like that is very useful in that it provides a natural barrier to certain sorts of uh, um, bad thinking, for instance, or uh, 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 biased thinking in one way or another. And at the same time, though, there are other areas where I think AI will be coming in very strong, where it looks as if you might want to eliminate the gaps. Um, this bothers me. I haven't got my head around it completely. But an idea which is being discussed now a lot is elder care. We have the number of people who are old who need some kind of assistance in their living is going to grow at a great rate in the next 20, 30 years. And the idea of home care robots that will not just feed and clothe and protect the aged, but the companions arises. And uh, there are people working on it very hard. And they're idealistic people. They see this as a wonderful problem. Compare it with telephone operators in the old days. There used to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people, mostly women, who worked rather boring jobs doing the telephone switchboard. All replaced by machine. That's fine. They lost their jobs, but you don't want to do that kind of job. Well, now we might want to say, you know, spending an eight-hour day or a 12-hour day taking care of a very old person is not a very nice job either. Some people may really find that gratifying, but it's, it's not the sort of work you would particularly want to uh, uh, see your family members uh, as their life's work. Wouldn't it be better to automate that? But wouldn't it be better to automate that with AIs that could respond to the elders that they were caring for uh, in more interesting ways? And here, I think, while as we can worry about them being too anthropomorphic and this being creepy and, and so forth. I tell you, I'll speak for myself. If I get in that position and I've got three robots that I can play contract bridge with until I'm tired of playing contract bridge, I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> and uh, the fact that they, they weren't responsible human agents would not matter that much to me, I don't think. And so it's a, it's a real problem. Okay, hello. Uh, I have only this small, little bit stupid question, and I wanted to ask you, what is the comprehension, comprehension to you? What is the border between the competence and comprehension, actually? Yes. What do we need comprehension for if we can have all this competence? It's a, it's a question I address in the book. Um, and I think the best 
answer I've come up with so far is that, after all, what comprehension officially is supposed to be good for is projecting imaginatively and reliably into the future. If you, we as a, as a species can see ahead in a way no other species can. We can see ahead sometimes years, sometimes thousands of years, sometimes, well, to the heat death of the universe. And you, you can't do that without comprehension. Seeing, having a temporal horizon that is very far out and which permits very detailed exploration of that space offline in advance of actually encountering it is the most important aspect of comprehension. One example, I want everybody in the world to start thinking imaginatively about what they would do when the internet crashes. I know people who say it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It will happen. And we've become so dependent on the internet. It would probably take down the power grid. It would take down the mobile phone networks. It would take down radio and television. We would be plunged into electronic darkness. What are you going to do when that happens? And I'm afraid that most people would panic. Most people in Western advanced technology dependent society would panic and panic in extremely self-destructive ways. The only antidote for that impending panic, I think, is comprehension. We have to get people to think imaginatively about this and use every technology at our disposal already to get people to imagine different scenarios for what they might do, might need, might, might care about the most when they're suddenly thrust back into the 19th century technology. I think that is an issue everybody should be thinking about in their spare time, just so that when it happens, a lot of people should be thinking about it full time, but so that when it happens, people won't just go nuts, which will be a very real possibility for many people, so that they have some resources of calm and reflection that they can fall back on and not be prey to, I'm sure, the crazy people around who will tell them, join us and we will protect you. So now we have one question here, then one on the left side, and then again in the center, and then I'm afraid we will have to stop. So, so please. Hello. Um, I was thinking about your book, um, Freedom Evolves, where you try to deal with the problem of the experiments on free will by saying, we're not out of the loop, we are the loop. In other words, we are also the unconscious brain processes as well as the conscious thoughts. So the you is bigger than this small point. I think for what you said today though is that um, if who you are includes all the um, invading mental tools, then the distinction between tools and colleagues is maybe difficult because you are these tools, which the loop is not just in your brain, it's including all, the, yes. all these social cultural loops and invasive tools and uh, languages. So how, how would you see the distinction or is there a distinction between the you and all of this wider very, yes. Very good question. How do I distinguish between the... Uh, if we agree that the, the singularity point, you, the Cartesian race cogitan sitting in the brain, that's a hopeless idea. So you're bigger than that. You, you are the whole control system of your body. But you're bigger than that, too, because it includes your technical help 
and it includes your friends and associates. And I think we have not paid enough attention to the extent to which we rely and should rely on our companions and colleagues to help us do better than we otherwise would. I myself am, have often been struck by how behaving in the presence of my children or grandchildren braces me up to behave more braver, more calm, <laughs> uh, more understanding than I otherwise would be. And I think we all can benefit from the help we get from those whose opinion of us matters and whose respect and love for us matters. So indeed, I think what you are, the idea that there's a punctate or even a isolated uh, you with a membrane around it, um, that's an idea which works pretty well for a bacterium, but not for us. One question there. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I have a question that is connected to what you said about uh, comprehension. And um, the question is, what are your thoughts on the attempts to formulate a general theory of everything? Is it a worthwhile or futile enterprise? And what features should a good theory of everything have? I think it's an inevitable project uh, uh, because uh, people have been trying for a theory of everything since Aristotle, since Thales, you might say, and we've been making progress. And so why stop now? <laughs> there are still plenty of areas of confusion and mystery. And I think the goal, the goal of a unified theory is not only uh, a wonderful goal, but I think that Darwin did more to unify that theory than anybody else. Because it's Darwin, his insights, that unites chemistry and physics on the one hand with, with poetry and government and vision and dreaming and thinking and living on the other. It's what puts the, the Geisteswissenschaft and the Naturwissenschaft together. And it's right. So we have, we have the main bridge. We can get not just from bacteria to Bach, we can get from electrons to Einstein. And there's plenty of more work to do. And a lot of it, we now understand, would not be done by counting the atoms. It'll be done at a higher level of theory. It'll be done by theories in the social sciences, for instance, or even um, models and theories in the humanities. But I, th I think unification is a great idea. There are two last questions here in the center, yeah? Please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your talk. And I would like to have a follow up on the question about decomprehension and uh, your understanding of this concept. I got a feeling that you are using uh, uh, comprehension and understanding as in synonyms. Whether yeah. this is true. And yeah, yes. I am. So I remember a very interesting discussion about the concept of understanding when it, when it was attacked by J.D. Drought, who was uh, actually saying that. The, un the understanding is only a feeling based on two cognitive biases, bias of overconfidence and hindsight, and uh, saying that uh, we need some high higher order theory to judge the understanding or the comprehension as a proper understanding or comprehension. So it's only a feeling which is based on combination of two different cognitive biases. And who said that? Uh, it was J.D. Trout, somewhere 2010 uh, study about understanding, and it actually caused uh, interesting discussion about it. Okay. And I well, remember. Yeah. I don't know the study. 
Um, I'll have to look at it. Uh, I think there's a, a common misapprehension, which I have no way of knowing whether, whether your author here is, is falling into this trap, of thinking that comprehension is a feeling. There are feelings of comprehension, the so-called aha phenomenon, where there's something that's puzzling. I, I, a former colleague of mine actually studied the aha phenomenon as a psychologist, had wonderful examples of uh, uh, initially puzzling little uh, descriptions, and then finally you get one more detail and ah, now you see what it's all about. So he went to measure the aha feeling. Aha feelings are real, it's, you can study that, but that's not what comprehension is. Um, I think Descartes put us on the wrong avenue there by talking about conception as a, as a grasping of something that's clear and distinct, as if that were a solitary thing. It would be like smelling a rose or hearing a sound. Comprehension isn't like that. It is a... Uh, uh, it's a set of competences. And you don't really know if you understand something until you see all the different things you can do with that concept. And that's a matter of uh, variegated testing, not something that you can just look in your mind. And philosophers who say, I can conceive of this, but I can't conceive of that. It's not worth the ink they write with. Uh, they don't know what they can conceive and what they can't conceive until they do the hard work. And I hope it's the last question. Okay, hello. Uh, hello. I have a question on language. Uh, language is clearly crucial for any kind of human software. So I was wondering, uh, could you at least sketch how you imagine its very origins? Oh. There's a, there's more than a chapter on the origin of language, which is a very wonderful, dark, controversial field right now, but there's also some brilliant strokes. And I've just been uh, talking about it with colleagues in the last week quite a bit. Um, I now think the chapter in my book is, I'd like to rewrite it a little bit. Uh, from some arguments I've entertained and considered in the last week. Um, the first thing you have to appreciate is that um, words, they're the best memes of all. You can count them, you can recognize them, they replicate, they have lineages, they have histories, they compete in effect for space in your brain. And we can understand, what, what we have to do to get the language ball rolling is we have to come up with a scenario where something that aren't words yet and that aren't even parts of words can get a foot in by being, for various biological reasons, uh, items to be replicated. And they might be sounds that have no meaning, but are sort of like music, like bird song, that are easily replicated. And eventually those are going to turn into phonemes. And phonemes, as I argue in the book, are one of the greatest inventions of natural selection. Because phonemes are effortlessly identifiable by native speakers even though physically they are not very similar at all. That is, <clears throat> listen carefully, cat, 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 cat. Those were all tokens of the word cat. You had no trouble identifying them as tokens of the word cat, including the tokens in the sentence I just said. And they're all in different contexts, and you have, the, you have the English virtual machine in your head, 
and you automatically find those, that type of which those are tokens. Brilliant invention. Nobody invented it. That's evolution invented the phoneme, and that was a precursor for language. I, th many more details in the book if you read it. So many thanks again for this exciting afternoon. And we very much hope that this was not the last chance to listen to your talk and to see both of you in Prague. So many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.